Hello everyone, Arnon Mello here. I am the president for Mellowhawk Logistics. And for two decades, Mellowhawk Logistics has been helping Canadian and Brazilian companies move product worldwide by air, ocean, and trucking. We also provide customs clearances services in Canada and in Brazil, and we provide consulting to your company who is trying to start a business of importing and exporting. We are honored to be a sponsor at the 15th annual Doing Business in Brazil event from the BCCC, and we look forward to seeing you this week. Thank you very much and see you then. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the third session of our 15th edition of the Brazil-Canada Chamber of Commerce traditional doing business in Brazil event. I'm Carolina Alberna, CEO of the Brazil Canada Chamber of Commerce here in Toronto and will be your MC today. So the setup today will be a little bit different than the previous sessions as we will be focusing on how to enter the Brazilian market. We invited six experts to discuss an array of subjects that are relevant and important for Canadian companies looking to do business with Brazil. We won't have a Q&A session as after the presentations at 4.15 p.m. Canadian time, 5.15 p.m. Brazil time, we will host uh, five breakout sessions where the speakers will be available to answer any questions you might have in each one of the specific subjects. Unfortunately, due to a conflict of agenda, we won't be able to host a breakout session on ESG and procurement supply chain. So for this specific discussion, we ask you to add some questions into the Q&A box and Alicia will do her best to answer all of them. Uh, the breakout sessions will be hosted in a different link as the webinar feature from Zoom doesn't allow this functionality, functionality quite yet. So you must have received the link to access the breakout sessions. If you haven't, we will be adding that link in the chat uh, here today. Before I invite our first panelist of the day, I would like to remind you all just that the BCCC is a membership-based organization that supports its members through information networking and advocacy. And we are well positioned to support your company in doing business in Brazil. So if you're interested in understanding more how we can help, please feel free to reach out to us anytime. Uh, we have a very packed agenda here today. So without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker of the day, Gustavo Zentner, president at Interpoc Inc., chair of the BCCC, uh, Winnipeg Chapter and Honorary Consul of Brazil in Winnipeg to present the opening remarks. Gustavo, thank you for being here and uh, the stage is yours. Bom dia a todos. Muito obrigado, Carolina. Thank you. Carolina, can you please confirm you can see my first slide? Yes. It's a pleasure to join you and, and I would really like to say on behalf of um, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and Manitoba Chapter, all of the organizations that are sponsoring this event, that this is a tremendous milestone. Celebrating 15, the 15th edition of this uh, Doing Business in Brazil seminar, it's, it's quite remarkable because it's not just the work that um, the companies and the chamber has put together. It's all of you, the participants that are already active in either of the markets, and those of you that are doing your due diligence to expand into any of those markets, specifically into Brazil. I am humbled, I'm honored to serve as the Honorary Consul of Brazil in Manitoba, which effectively means that any Brazilian entity, uh, Brazilian uh, student, immigrant, or a tourist that passes through this jurisdiction would have an extension of services at your disposal. I also want to say that I'm privileged to share the panel today with a, a tremendous amount of talented business people that will be sharing their expertise. So I'd like to jump into that by acknowledging that this program is um, done in support and coordination with both the federal government of Canada and their presence in Brazil, as well as the federal government of Brazil and their presence through the Consulate General in Toronto and the Embassy of Brazil in Ottawa. The session focuses on practical steps and what best way of um, having a focus on that than really a, a private, quiet, but honest reflection. And these are the six points that I wanted to share with you today briefly before the other experts join in and share their hands-on expertise. The first uh, common mistake, miscalculation that we have observed over, over the years from my perspective, from our business, is that most people fail to truly get to understand and appreciate the ethos of the Brazilian people. 
Um, there are many jurisdictions in Brazil, like we have in Canada. So both uh, for those Canadian um, citizens, for those Canadian uh, business people attending, and for the Canadian corporations that are be, that are part of this series, just like we recognize that Central Canada and the prairies and the east and west coast are different in our north, of course, you have to focus yourself and your team from that perspective and truly understanding what is the ethos of the Brazilian nation. And you'll get to see, and I think uh, you'll be quite impressed to see how different, how diverse there is, how diverse it is, and that you really need to adjust internal presentations, the way in which you present your product, your services, and your people from a Canadian perspective, and the way that those are received in Brazil. If you're in the agricultural sector, you'll likely be going to the south, southeast of Brazil, very different culture than what you'll find in central Brazil or in the north. And the same would apply to the rest of the country. This also has to do with your industry. So very important to focus on the personalities and the ethos behind those personalities. And I alluded to this uh, on my, I just alluded to this and that's why I jump on my second point. People talk about let's go to Brazil and do business in Brazil. And I often say, if this person or company only knew that there's more than one Brazil. Brazil is such a vast market compared to the size of the Canadian um, economy, geography, population wise, sector strength and expertise. You really wanna define uh, as close as you possibly can, what is your state, the niche market, and the value proposition that you bring to that market. I'd like you to know that this is not a self-promotion uh, about Brazil. It's not a government endorsement and certainly not a diplomatic statement. The fact of the matter is that Brazil is a fairly advanced economy, uh, fairly aggressive in terms of uh, its growth potential, and that has a lot going for it. So those Canadian companies that are looking at expanding into the Brazilian market really need to do their homework and understand which geographic destination they're going after. Is it with product or services? And I'll touch on how to enter that later on. The third one is to have your end game in mind. So basically as a best practice from my company, Interpop, International Point of Commerce, we specialize in professional advisory services and market expansion. And we tend to work with you Canadian companies to focus on what is it that we want to accomplish in a short, medium and long term. Are we looking at owning a full subsidiary, expanding into that market um, organically or through an M&A or a JV, a joint venture or, or a merger and acquisition? And then once we define what kind of future state we want to be in, we start planning backwards and deconstruct all of the steps that we need to undertake with you, with your in-house knowledge, with your technical and service expertise to build that plan. Today, we're gonna to hear from other experts um, that we are privileged to, be, to do business with, to partner with on the ground, both in Canada and in Brazil. But the key message here that I think you'll, get, you'll take away from everybody on these panels is that you need to plan a strategy that is directly linked for that market. And to wrap that up as a concept, Again, for Canadian companies already active in export activities into the US that have then grown organically into Mexico, perhaps Europe. Brazil is not the same as Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, and the rest of, the Latin, of Latin America or South America. You're dealing with the strongest, largest economy of the Mercosur. You need to understand that like you have experience in between the Canadian, the American and the Mexican markets on NAFTA or, or Kuzma or USMCA, the Mercosur dynamic is something that is changing on a daily or weekly basis. And that change is quite often by and large out of your control. What you have under your control is your proper planning and process to enter that market. And that control is what we refer to the regulatory regime. Some of the main pitfalls or mistakes that we see Canadian uh, entrepreneurs or companies do is to properly plan or, um, or to underestimate the complexity of the taxation and the import export environment in Brazil. So this is not to scare you, but simply to um, alert you of those complexities and differences that are fairly substantial compared to the, the way in which Canadian companies cross the border into the US or the way in which we have our um, 
um, experts or service providers or salespeople or technical people cross the borders. And this is something that you definitely want to keep in mind. The last two points that I wanted to touch on are market entry strategy and your approach. Are you going at it from a direct or an indirect perspective? So if you're exporting already products or services into the US and then there's an American company exporting components or machinery that has uh, your Canadian made product as a component of it, and that component from the US or the big piece of equipment from the US gets exported into Brazil, you are already indirectly exporting into the Brazilian market. And as you see that more of your products, potentially your services, um, get to enter the Brazilian or the Mercosur market, that's a, a very strong indication that you might want to look at developing your own direct export plan. There is expertise throughout Brazil. The main uh, area of focus for you as a Canadian company and exporter is to plan the kind of exposure that you can absorb to look inside your organization and determine what kind of skills you have to be able to accompany or sustain that growth. And of course, to retain either experts through um, chambers of commerce, such as ours, um, governments, sector organizations, and then private sector support companies that would either guide you from a legal perspective, taxation planning and duties, or from a freight forwarding perspective, and hence the, the importance of this panel. The last one is the environmental scan. And if I have to pick any one of the six, the, the one that I will place my, my focus the most is the sixth one. And with this one, I'm going to wrap up the six considerations. The environmental scan deserves a lot of attention for the simple reason that um, there are external factors that affect a Canadian company's ability to remain, grow within the Brazilian market. That environmental scan means that other, uh, either Canadian competitors or American competitors are already likely doing the same things that we are from a Canadian perspective. And they're actually focusing on how do they grow their market? So it's not just how do we expand into Brazil, but what are the competitors doing? And how the ethos of the people that we're dealing with will affect our decision-making and how that regulatory regime, which is external and out of our control will affect our ability to remain, retain or sustain our presence. So um, as we get through the presentations and the workshop later, later on today, I wanted to highlight what are the areas in which we may uh, start a conversation. The six points that I mentioned before are not a free giveaway, but rather an opportunity to share with you the most critical aspects of planning your expansion into Brazil, your growth into the market, and are meant to be used as a starter for a conversation. We at Interpoc focus on uh, foreign direct investment and foreign direct ownership. So we assist companies by becoming their eyes and ears and hands on the ground. We work for uh, companies in industry to facilitate market access channel, to develop or grow your business and to foster opportunities for JV or M&A. And for those of you that work for uh, government agencies or economic development organizations, in our practice, we tend to focus on how do you promote, how do we help you promote your geographic market and identify potential partners in the Brazilian economy that could either become part of your supply chain or your market entry point. I'm looking forward to the discussion later on today. I'm also looking forward to, to learning from the expertise that comes into this panel. And with this, I wanna thank you once again and wish every success to all of the presenters today. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, Gustavo, for uh, your insights and for your expertise uh, and to, to share with us all those six important points and tips on, on how to enter the Brazilian market. Um, so without further ado, I will, let me just, um, I would like to invite, we're gonna have to switch a little bit the agenda because of a conflict. So our next speaker is today will be uh, Philip Jeffrey, head of Canadian desk at FCR Law and Eduardo Fleury, partner FC, at FCR Law, who will present on legal requirements, taxation, and labor. So, Philip, Eduardo, thanks for being here. Uh, stage is yours. But uh, let's start saying that uh, I would like to thank thank BBC, BBC, BCCC for this invita invitation. For us, it's very important to take part of this panel to explain uh, everything about, to try to explain most of the things that is necessary to have if you want to make business in Brazil. Okay, and so thank you, BCC, and a special thank you for Carolina 
that uh, she she is uh, helping us in many aspects of our uh, business in Canada. And so thank you, Caroline, especially. So uh, let's go further uh, with the presentation, please. Uh, Philip, can you skip the slide? Philippe, yes. can you move? Can I'm you move to the? Here. I'm trying here. So um, we are uh, FCR Law is a firm, a law firm in Brazil that we have. Uh, uh, basically, we have forty lawyers. Okay, the hours hours light. Uh, we have four forty lawyers, and uh, we our main area of practices are corporate law and agreements that help so much companies, uh, foreign companies to make business in Brazil. And of course, taxation and labor. We handle uh, both advisor and litigation in this area. And so for Brazilian purpose, I would say that uh, you have to pay attention in this. Uh, this is, these are the main areas that you have to pay attention. Labor is important in Brazil also. Sometimes in other countries, labor is not so important. But labor law in Brazil is very important. Okay, of course, taxation uh, also is very important, and corporate law and contracts is going as important as it, it is in other countries. And uh, uh, we have a, in our law firm uh, a Canadian desk that is uh, the head of the Canadian Canadian tax is Philip Jeffrey that will talk with you guys as after my my part of the presentation, and uh, he will talk about uh, the taxation in Brazil. And of course, of course, Philip Jeffrey is Canadian. Which, he, uh, which is very important for, uh, because he, he can handle both sides of the, uh, the law, the Canadian law and the Brazilian law. And also uh, we have a German desk that uh, my partners, Marcelo Coimbra and Lux, Lucas Homburg, they handle this German desk. It's a very important part of our law firm uh, with uh, the relationship with uh, German, German companies, okay? Also, uh, I have a, a special expertise in US taxation. And so we have, of course, many US companies that will help to make business in Brazil. And sometimes we help the Brazilian companies to make business in the US. Uh, we have a recognition from uh, some rankings like the legal 500 and the word tax. And so it's a kind of work and uh, we have some kind of uh, a very friendly, I would say, uh, phrases from our client, clients about what we do for them uh, in order to make uh, business in Brazil. Okay, uh, please, Felipe, can you can you skip? Okay, doing business in Brazil. What we try to do here in Brazil uh, when you try to to help the Brazilian uh, uh, the the foreign companies, especially the Canadian companies, to make business in Brazil, we try to uh, to help them to make business, but we don't, usually we, we don't think like, uh, oh, you have to be a, a presence in Brazil. You have the, the idea of our company is to help the company to make business in Brazil. Sometimes they don't need to have a, a subsidiary in Brazil. Sometimes they only can sell the product or services directly to the end client. So uh, that's that's the way that works. We don't uh, uh, we are not giving to you an, an advice saying, oh, you have to open a company in Brazil. We are going to, to advise you to have a company in Brazil only if it's necessary. So it's very clear that the, our, our job in this case. And uh, uh, Brazil is, is, there's no, basically there's no restriction in making business in Brazil uh, with, uh, as a foreign investor. There's no restriction to open a company. You, have, you can have a, a, a company wholly owned by foreign investors. There's no restrictions. Uh, the payments are easy to do. Uh, if let's suppose from Brazilian comp from uh, a Brazilian client to a, a Canadian company, there is no restriction basically. So the inflows and outflows of investments is easily. There is no restriction about that too. Sometimes you have to only register some operations in the before the uh, the Brazilian central bank. But in fact, it's 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 about to be changed. In fact, uh, we expect that next year a new regulation will be issued issued by the Brazilian Central Bank, and you don't need to make this kind of registration. Okay, so it's a it's a very friendly for uh, foreign investors. And uh, to uh, to establish a presence in Brazil, I would say that the first thing that you have to do, and uh, if you have a product or service or software, you have to compare your price in Canada with the price that you have in Brazil. 
and that the market, the market price of your product in Brazil, the competitor price. And for that, you have to calculate the tax. I think uh, that's one advice that we usually give to the, to the companies, to the foreign companies, please understand how competitive you are in Brazil, but for that, you need to make the calculation of the taxes in Brazil that a little bit complicated, but Philippi will make it clear for you guys. I, I, I assure you, okay? And so um, after you, you, you make the calculation about uh, your, to see if you are competitive in Brazil, of course, you can choose how to make business in Brazil. You can only, but let's suppose some uh, through social media, through uh, advertise in, um, on the internet, uh, you can find your client or your client, or your client can find you. And so you can sell the product or the service to that. There's no necessity to have more than this. It's important to understand that if you are selling services, softwares, and assistance and so on, there's no much thing to, 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 to tell you about the way to, to sell directly to the clients. But if you are selling goods to Brazilian companies, you have to understand that not all the companies in Brazil have, not all of them have the license to make the importation. This license is named red radar. And so sometimes the company doesn't have this license. So they are not able to make the importation. So when you are talking or thinking to sell to a company and this company sell goods to the company, to Brazilian company, you have to check if they have the license to make the importation. It's important to understand that. And beside you selling direct to clients, sometimes you need, beside the, uh, using uh, internet, beside using social media, you can, need an agent or a commercial, commercial representative. And uh, this figure is very common in many countries, okay? There's no so much uh, difference uh, of this uh, figure in Brazil. And I will talk a little bit about this in the next slide. And uh, we also can have a distributor. Distributor is different because they assume the risk, the inventory risk usually, okay? And also you can have a, a physical presence, a local presence through subsidiaries and joint ventures. This, that's the, the way that you can have, uh, um, you can make business in Brazil. It's a kind of summary that we are uh, making this case. Uh, this, before we go into the next slide, I would like only to, 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 to clarify that uh, if you want to sell uh, products, to, products or services to Brazilian uh, government, now we have a, no, a, a new law, a new a non that regulated the regulated the transactions with the government that is very friendly to foreign companies, and so we can sell directly from uh, from Canada to a Brazilian government. So, uh, of course, this law is uh, being implemented; it's not totally uh, in force right now, but uh, uh, it's it's very important. It will change a lot the relationship between the foreign companies and the government in Brazil. Felipe, please, can you go forward with the next slide? Philip? Okay. Uh, this is a, Philip, I think it's part of the slide is out. Go ahead, okay. Uh, this is the, a comparison between uh, if you decide to make business using agents and using distributors. Agents, like I say, like I said, is, uh, is commercial representative. Uh, the agents, the commercial representative, they, are, they have a special law and they have a special rules. It's not an agreement that you have to celebrate the agreement with them. And uh, we advise you, we strongly advise you to, to have a written agreement with them. But there is a, this law that regulates the, this relationship is very protective. And so we have uh, to know about some, some rules about that. For example, uh, in the agreement, it's very important to, let's suppose, to, to put the per period or term of the representation. You have, you have to def uh, define the territory, the region that the, the commercial representative can uh, act on your behalf. And so there's a lot of things that you have to put in the in the agreement in order to protect you, uh, the Canadian company, or someone that wants to make business in Brazil using an, a commercial representative. And uh, one thing that's very important is the 
how much you are going to pay to them. It's important to, to fix the, the way that you, that you are going to calculate the commissions that you are going to pay to them. Because there is another rule in this law saying you cannot reduce this, uh, uh, this commission. In fact, you can, for example, reduce a, a, like a percentage of the commission, but uh, in order to compensate this, uh, this loss, you have to give, let's suppose, another region to be explored by the commercial representative, or you can give to them like another product or service that they can sell. And so if you reduce a commission, you have to compensate with another opportunity of business. So it's an, it's an important uh, rule that you have to follow if you decide to hire agent to help you to make business in Brazil, to sell products in Brazil, to sell products and services and softwares and so on. And um, the other very important rule in this case is about uh, the moment that you want to fire the, the, represent, the commercial representative. In this case, you have to pay, if you are firing him, whatever is the, the situation that you, you, you deciding to, 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 to dismiss, to, to fire this guy, you have to pay an indemnification. It's, it's about 8.3% on the top of all commissions that you paid to this guy through the entire uh, period that you that the agreement is in force. Since so, you have to calculate all the commissions that you paid since you hired this agent until the time that you decided to to fire him or her, and you have to calculate eight point three percent. That will be the penalty, the indemnification that you have to pay. This is a law and you cannot avoid this. Of course, if the agent decides to, uh, to, uh, to dismiss, to, to leave the company, no indemnification is uh, due, okay? And uh, uh, if you compare to the distribution agreement, the distribution agreement, uh, the distribution agreement is uh, very, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, important. But in this case, there is no a kind of protective law. And it's important to understand that in this case, you have to also have a, a written agreement with uh, the territory, the term, the description of the products or services in this case. It's, it's very similar, but it's not kind of protective as it is the, 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 the law that uh, rules the, the relationship with the agent. And so it's important that there's no indemnification the only thing that you have to do if you decide to, uh, to say, to break the agreement with the distributor, you have to give a prior 90, 90 days prior notice uh, of the termination of the agreement. And so that's what we have to do. It's very simple in this case. Uh, please. Okay. The other way, of course, to make business in Brazil, if it's necessary, that's the, the question. Huh? Okay. And uh, if it's necessary, is to, uh, to, to establish is to establish a company in Brazil. Of course, like other countries, we have many types of uh, uh, companies in Brazil. But especially, what matters for us is the uh, corporate, uh, the corporation, and the LLC. Basically, are the most uh, used uh, forms of uh, of company in Brazil. And of course, LLC is much more used, even for the um, even for the foreigner, foreigner investors, okay, foreigner companies. Uh, the corporations, which is called in Brazil Sociedade Anonima, is basically used uh, for companies that want to be public, okay, to open, to issue shares for the public, to go to the uh, market, uh, open market, and so it's, they usually, uh, they, uh, they have to use the uh, corporation, Sociedade Anonima. But the other companies, most even, big multinationals in Brazil, they use the LLC uh, format, okay? They, they use this, the, the LLC company. Uh, both corporation and LLC, they provide the, the limited responsibility, which is, which is the, uh, the, the responsibility of the partners is limited to the capital that was paid in, the, the capital that was contributed to the company. 
But in Brazil, be careful. You will have some exceptions, like uh, if you are talking about the labor debits, for example, if you if you have to pay some indemnification to the employees, this kind of responsibility can go to the to the partner. Okay, there is a rule for that. And in certain cases of the tax debits, can also have the responsibility of the partners. Uh, but beside these rules, the, the describe this case, uh, we don't have uh, the responsibility of the partners limited to the capital that was paid in. Okay, that's very uh, important to understand. Uh, you can have um, also uh, you can have one one only shareholder. Okay, and that's a, a new thing in Brazil. Is even the shareholder is a foreigner. We can have only one uh, one one uh, partner in this case. Okay. Uh, what is important to understand that the foreigner shareholder has to nominate a Brazilian guy, a Brazilian that, in fact, that someone that has a, a, a residence in Brazil, that is has a tax ID in Brazil, to be the legal representative in Brazil. We are not talking about the director of the company, the administration of the company that you create in Brazil. But if you want to create a company in Brazil, the shareholder, the foreigner shareholder, has to have a foreigner, a, a Brazilian representative that will sign. Of course, it's a kind of POA. Okay, it's a kind of uh, uh, you are going to represent the Brazilian, uh, the foreigner company before the like the courts in Brazil, before the tax uh, uh, authorities, and so on. It's basic, basically like some sometimes the lawyers do this kind of, uh, of, of job. Okay, so that's the basically the two uh, ways to uh, the two companies, the two types of uh, uh, companies that we use to make business in Brazil. So I advise you guys to make uh, uh, to use the IOC in most of the cases. Uh, now we are going to talk about the labor law. That's in, unfortunately, despite Brazilian uh, uh, labor law had has been reformed uh, for at least twice in the last four uh, years, even though you have some problems with the Brazilian uh, labor law. Uh, I think the most important point of this is when you decide to dismiss someone, to fire someone without cause. Uh, cause. In this case, you have to pay a penalty of 40% on the balance of uh, FG, FGTS. What is FGTS? FGTS is, a, is a, a bank account that the employee has. And every month, the company that when they are paying the salary to the, to the employee, they have to make a deposit in this bank account uh, that is 8% on the top uh, on the salary. And so every month you have to pay the salary and you have to pay 8% and put the, this money in the bank account in the name of this, the employee. And so when you decide to fire this guy, what, what's going to happen? You are going to, to, to see the balance of this bank account, and you have to calculate a 40% penalty on the top of the balance. And so you have to indemnificate, uh, to make a, to indemnificate the employee because they are, he is being uh, dismissed. Uh, of course, if uh, there is a just cause to dismiss this guy, in this case, you don't have to pay this indemnification. But uh, think about it. It's very difficult to prove that this guy uh, made something that justify this kind of uh, the, uh, to, to be fired with, with just cause. That's, that's one, one problem. And I don't like this rule, of course, especially because when you decide to fire someone, usually it, uh, it, it happens because the business is not going so well. And so when you are in a bad situation, you have to fire the guy. And when you, when you have to fire, you have to pay uh, indemnification to him. That's, it's not a, a very good um, uh, rule. But there is a, there's another problem also, not problems, but benefits that you have to pay to the employee. And uh, for example, the general rules, we have uh, eight hours per day, 40 hours uh, per week of work. Uh, the employee has the right of uh, a vacation for 30 days after 12 months of work. 
and uh, beside you have to pay the uh, you have to pay the vacation, and beside that you have to pay one third of a monthly salary. It's a kind of uh, premium to to uh, add additional payment to spend during the vacation. And uh, also we have what we sometimes they call Christmas bonus or a third thirteen salary, which is you don't have to you not only pay twelve salaries, but sometimes you have sometimes not you have to pay. 13 salaries do, during the, the year, okay? Uh, the maternity, maternity leave, it's four months, and uh, the, of course, we have to pay the salary, but sometimes the, gov the government reimburses you the salary that you are paying to the, uh, to the mother uh, in this case. Uh, the FGTS, that's what I, I explained to you guys, the 8% on the salary, okay? And uh, if you decide to, to the dismiss, to fire the guy, you have to give sometimes uh, a kind of a notice and they have to work for you 30 days or 90 days, depending how long they have been working for you. And uh, the payroll taxes is, I would say that you can vary from 23 to 27% on the, the top of the, the salary that we are paying to the, to, the, to the employee, okay? That's the part of the employer. The part of the employee, it's up to 14%, but it's limited to the, set, to the amount of 700 reais, 751 reais, which is very a low amount. The, the, the thing that you have to, to uh, the employer, the employer that has to pay attention in the social contribution that is from 23, 23 to 27, plus the 8% of the, the severance payment that is the FGTS, okay? So this is the basic cost that you have to pay attention, the vacation, the one third, one third on the, uh, of the vacation, on the salary when they, they take vacation, and of course, the 13th salary that you have to pay to them. Uh, basically, that's what we would like to talk about. And now, Philippe, will talk about the taxation in Brazil that is uh, another important point if you want to make business in Brazil. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for having us uh, today with you. Um, still having some problems with my slides here. And let me see if I can. There it is. Uh, so we're getting to, to the most interesting, but most likely the most challenging part of our presentation here uh, to talk about taxation. And to make things worse, Carolina just informed me that uh, I have approximately five minutes to talk about, <laughs> about the taxation in Brazil. So I think what I will try to do, and, and, and uh, I will be at the breakout sessions a little bit later on today, so people that want to continue the discussions or to ask me some, some specific questions, uh, that will be my, my pleasure to discuss with you. Uh, but I think short a few times, I think I, I need to pass the main messages regarding taxation. Uh, obviously, uh, Brazil is known to have a, a decent complex uh, system. Uh, so this is something that foreign companies and Canadian companies will need to spend a little bit more time uh, that potentially when they invest in other countries, because uh, for, for been working in Brazil for 20 years, I realized that uh, if the foreign company does not take the necessary time uh, to understand, obviously to a certain extent, how taxation works uh, and what is important to know and to do and not to do, uh, often wise those companies uh, do not manage to have the success that they are expecting in Brazil. So taxation, uh, is, is complex, but uh, I mean, uh, all companies in Brazil are subject to the same tax regime. And uh, I think good advisors, obviously, that can help you to navigate in this complexity system. I mean, uh, everything should be, should be fine. So uh, here I'm just showing you an overview of all the taxes in Brazil, uh, taxes and contributions, uh, corporate tax and transaction tax. Pretty much you will need to know a little bit about all of those taxes and contributions uh, before you start operating in Brazil to help you to define your pricing, what kind of margin you can have, and, and, and so on. So here, I, I try to keep it as practical as possible. Uh, here I'm showing you in the case, uh, like Eduardo was mentioning, it is not necessarily uh, uh, an obligation to have a company in Brazil to operate locally. 
uh, depends of the circumstances. And obviously, tax can be also uh, an important aspect uh, to define if you should or not have a Brazilian company. So here I'm showing you an example of a Canadian company selling services and software to Brazil. And on the right side, uh, the same Canadian company selling goods to, um, to Brazil. So quickly, if we look at the service and software transaction on the left side, I think the first thing you should notice is that the taxation on software transaction is, is much lower than the taxation on service transaction. Uh, there are two taxes that are not due on software transaction. So what, when we work with technology companies, we always try to, to, together with them, to try to allocate when it's possible, obviously, a bigger portion potentially to the software and a lower portion to the services to try to have a most tax efficient structures. Uh, so I think this is important for technology companies and, and software companies to understand uh, that services are subject to much higher taxation than, than software. Regarding the sales of goods to Brazil, uh, the taxes that I'm showing on the right side uh, tables uh, are applicable. The rates of mostly of those taxes are defined by the tariff code of your product, um, mainly for the first one, which is an export duty, the II and the IPI. Uh, and another point that often Canadian companies, they look at this and they say, well, I cannot, I cannot have success in Brazil with those type of, this type of level of taxation. Uh, it depends. Uh, the import duty, as an example, is a cost of transaction, so it's always uh, the most, let's say the first one that we, we look at it to see what kind of costs are we talking about this. But depending on how the, the transaction is structured and to who you are selling and what would be the use of the goods that you're selling, uh, potentially all of the other taxes, the IPI, physical fees, and ICMS could potentially be creditable and not necessarily a cost. Uh, so this is something that, you know, like a, I understand sometimes companies will say, well, this is very high taxation. But again, we need to look on a case-by-case -case basis to see what can be creditable and what will not be creditable, okay? We are simply showing the type of exercise that we do with our client to simulate what will be, uh, what is the applicable taxation first, and second, what will be the selling price of what they will be selling uh, to, to, to Brazil. So again, by just looking the bottom line of those tables here, you can see that the uh, service, the software transaction is slightly lower than, than the other one, okay? Now, when a, when a Canadian company takes the decision, uh, either for business reasons or tax reasons or, or, or other potential reason to open uh, their companies in Brazil, normally, at, at least at the beginning of the operation, the Canadian company will still need to sell the services and softwares, all the goods to the Brazilian company that will then uh, resell them in, in the local market. So here, the open part of, of, of my slides here are the same, the same taxes that I talked to you on my previous slides. And the three tables below are the taxes that will be due by the Brazilian company, either on resale of service, resales of goods, and obviously the net result of what will be generated in Brazil will be subject to corporate income tax, which is the lower table here at the rate of 34%. Whatever is left in the Brazilian company can be paid out as a dividend. For the time being, dividend is probably the only thing that is not subject to tax in Brazil. So payments of dividends from Brazil to Canada or other countries uh, are not subject to, to taxation. So this is also something that it's important to plan and, and to simulate to see how we can try to allocate potentially higher portion to dividends than other, other transactions. And I, I'm saying uh, for the time being, because uh, Brazil is currently discussing uh, important tax reform. And one of the, uh, one of the goals of, of the tax reform will be to reduce the corporate income tax rate, but to start taxing the payment of dividends. So this is something that uh, we are obviously monitoring and it, Eduardo is, is really involved on, on, on those discussions. Here, and I'm almost done, Carol, uh, it's almost finished here. Obviously I will not pass through this table, but here's the full tax simulation that what we do for our clients, uh, selling from Canada first, then to the local subsidiary, and then the subsidiary is, is reselling uh, in the local market. And this is the type of exercise that is extremely important for you guys to, to have in mind that you will need to go through that because uh, and we can do those simulation going up 
down or we can also do down up depending of if you have a fixed price that you can sell in Brazil, if you have an expected margin that you can have uh, and so on. Uh, but again, this is extremely important because again, I've seen a lot of Canadian companies saying that, well, uh, I know how this works. Uh, they do not calculate the tax properly. And at the end of the day, uh, they can have very bad surprises, uh, mainly regarding the margin that they are expecting to have in Brazil. So this is something that is key uh, to have success in, in Brazil. Okay. And my last slides uh, is, is to mention that there is a tax treaty between Brazil and Canada. So this is a good thing. Uh, however, the tax treaty does not have uh, the effect of reducing the taxation in Brazil. Why? Because the limitation of the taxation in the tax treaty is pretty much the same rate that we have in the domestic market here. Uh, so, you know, don't expect the tax treaty to reduce the taxation in Brazil because this is not normally the case. The only thing that is important for you to, to know is the tax treaty includes what we call a tax sparing clause. What is that? Is, is a benefit that, uh, that uh, the two countries give uh, by saying that, I'll give you an example, interest as an example. Uh, the payment of interest from Brazil to Canada is subject to a 15% withholding tax, but, but the treaty will allow the Canadian company to claim a tax credit in Canada for the foreign tax at a rate of 20%, even if the tax was, was withheld in Brazil at 15%. So it's kind of like an additional 5% benefit that is given to, uh, to the Canadian company. So that was it for my very limited time to talk about taxation. Um, but again, I will be in the breakout session, so I'll be more than pleased to answer all the questions and I can understand that you, you, you will potentially have few questions. Thank you, Galen. Thank you, Philippe, and thank you, Eduardo. And sorry for, for the messages. Uh, uh, I wish we had more time. And the idea is that you guys will have 45 minutes with Philippe after the, the events to mm -hmm. really go through the details of how to calculate or how to, to better understand the Brazilian taxation service. So I'd just like to, to remind all our speakers today that our time is very limited because we have like all the presentations and the breakout sessions after. So just to um, uh, try to stick to the time. I would like to invite our next speakers of the day then today, I know Mello and Peter Hawkins from Mello Hawk Logistics, who will present on importing into Brazil what you need to know. I know thanks for being here and the mic is yours. Thank you, Carolina, very much. Thank you to the chamber uh, for this opportunity. It's great to be sponsored this event that is so important to Canadian companies and Brazilian companies as well. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and hopefully uh, everyone can see it. Great, thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna try to be, uh, um, not go over my time. There's a lot to talk about logistics nowadays. So uh, we are Melohawk Logistics together with Peter, my partner and our team in Toronto and in Miami as well. We are a logistics provider. And what, what is that? We move cargo around the world and uh, we do customs clearances and we do a lot of consulting. I am Brazilian, so Brazil is a niche market for us. And, um, and we are an approved supplier from the Canadian government and the Brazilian governments as well, so helping both sides. And nowadays with COVID, we've been doing a lot of consulting and a lot of talking about what's happening in the market. And we're gonna touch up uh, that a little bit um, uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, so we have moved and worked in different sectors for many years, moving food products to the CL Food Show in Canada, helping the Brazilian ball in Toronto move costumes, moving costumes from Elton John all over the world, artwork, and also machinery. So in all these sectors, you need to know documents, you need to know what your clients need to import and clear customs. And this is crucial as well in Brazil, as Philippe mentioned. And I like to start with this slide and talk about Incoterms, um, which is the transfer of, uh, um, of risk and cost when you're moving a product across borders. And most people know FOB and CIF, but we are now on Incoterms 2020 and there's 11 of them. So I warn you that if you're doing an international transaction on every document, you must stipulate the inco terms that you're going to sell your product or buy your product from your buyer or seller because if there is a loss in transit 
um, your insurance company is going to look first at the INCO terms in order to analyze uh, if they're going to honor your uh, insurance policy that you have purchased or not. So uh, be very careful uh, in listing proper INCO terms on all your documents. Uh, I'm going to dive right in. Uh, Brazil, did you know, as uh, uh, some people already mentioned previously, uh, a company in Brazil must have a radar, which is issued through the Cisco Max system, um, in order to import or export um, any product. Um, so if you're trying, if you're a Canadian company trying to sell something to Brazil, your first question, as, as was mentioned before, um, hello, company ABC, have you imported before or you have the authorization to import? Because if they don't, they, they can't import your product. They're, they're going to have to um, get this authorization and um, make sure they have everything in order with other government uh, agencies to import that particular product. If we're talking about food, there is a secondary license you're going to need. If you're shipping certain types of technology, you're going to need another uh, type of, of license. And if you're shipping medicine or things that are going to be consumed by a human, uh, and visa could be involved on in this, which is very complex. Uh, air and ocean shipments to Brazil can take five to 15 days to clear customs, which is very different than Canada, which takes 15 minutes to an hour to clear customs when we import something into Canada. So, and uh, with COVID, uh, th these times have been extended. We see a crisis everywhere. So you need to give time, you need to plan, you need to make sure your customer that is buying your product is ready. All customs clearances processes in, into Brazil must be done by a Brazilian company. A foreign company cannot be the import of record, making DDP shipments impossible into Brazil. And I'm going to uh, spend a little time on this uh, subject because I get calls every day of my Canadian clients saying, Arno, I, I have a buyer in Brazil and the buyer in Brazil wants me to calculate duties and taxes on my product going to Brazil. And I tell them, well, go back to them and tell them that that homework needs to be done in Brazil, not in Canada. Why? Because a company in Brazil that is formed and ready to import it can be formed in any state or any part of Brazil, or they can have an incentive to import that particular product. So you, as the Canadian exporter, and I, as the freight forwarder or customs broker, can give you the schedule that Philip uh, showed here on the last presentation of the possible taxes a product can have. But you and I, you, the exporter in Canada, and I, the freight forwarder, or, or my customs broker, We'll never know for sure what are the exact taxes a specific Brazilian company will pay on a particular product. Only the importing company with their exclusive customs broker will be able to determine what they're going to be able to pay for duties and taxes. So I, I really advise you when somebody in Brazil asks you, please calculate duties and taxes for me, you go back to them and say, look, I'll give you uh, the cost of the product and the freight, which Melohawk can do for you anywhere, um, to the final uh, point of entry in Brazil, which would be the airport or the port. From that point on, you can tell your Brazilian customs uh, customer, uh, please uh, speak to your customs broker. Here's the commercial invoice. I'm sure they will be able to give you specific importation taxes on the product because I find there is a lot of work that is uh, put on the shoulders of Canadian companies for nothing. So I think Brazilians should uh, work together with their customs broker to make sure they know what they're going to pay in terms of taxes. And of course, we can help you uh, um, uh, determine uh, roughly what that taxation is, but it would be impossible to come up to the final penny on that calculation. Calculations of duties and taxes in Brazil, as I said, must be done by the importer, as I described. And most government institutions cannot import products. I've dealt with many companies that were trying to sell to the state of Sao Paulo or the government of whatever state. And that particular agency did not have the authorization to import. And some people within the organization didn't even know that. So they negotiated contracts. And when it got to the point of shipping, 
we found out that they did not have a radar. They had to then ask either for a special authorization from the government or use a trading company to import the product and then pass the nota fiscal internally in Brazil. So it is important for you, Canadian company, to ask the questions. Can you import? Do you have a radar? Are you a government agency? Who is the import of record in Brazil for that product? And of course, never ever ship any goods to Brazil without pre-approval of your client, their customs broker, and everyone in the chain. This is crucial. And I'll tell you a story that goes uh, either way. Uh, people think that shipping to Brazil is like shipping to the US or Europe. You can put on a courier, you can send a PDF um, with, with a PDF signature. Uh, every shipment in Brazil still to this day to be cleared, we need to send three copies of the commercial invoice and three copies of the packing list in original signed in blue ink. So shipping to Brazil is not for immatures. You need to know the rules. Do not ship anything without pre-approval. We for 20 years have been shipping to Brazil and we never ever encountered an error on mis or mistake on our part because we do our diligence in approving every single document with our partners and our clients to make sure none of it will interrupt customs clearance into Brazil. Of course, you have strikes, you have delays with COVID, we have no flights to Brazil, all of that. But in terms of documents, you need to be precise. One word on a document can cause confiscate, confiscation and fines and delays. So be, please be aware. Um, I will get Peter, my partner now, to talk about this slide and um, I'll come back to give you the insights of the COVID nightmare that we're living right now in the world. Peter? So, uh, thanks, Arno. Uh, I'm Peter Hawkins. I'm the Hawk and Mellow Hawk, and I'm also the co chair of the Brazil Canada Chamber of Commerce. And I just lost my slide, but that's okay. And so, one thing we want to underline while well, Arno gave you all the scary stuff, in fact, it's do your homework. It's make sure that you have really paid attention to all the things that can go wrong. And all the things can go wrong, however, they should not go wrong because there is tons of expertise to help you. So a couple of things and things to think about. Um, if, you're, if you're selling in Canada and doing really well, don't wait till you've exhausted your opportunities here before you do look elsewhere. Because it takes time to develop the market elsewhere, you should be doing both simultaneously. And in that vein, you should be using boards of trade and chambers of commerce like the BCCC. We have tons of expertise, tons of opportunities to help you. You must use the Trade Commissioner Service. That's free. That is the our Global Affairs has the Trade Commissioner Service in Brazil. It's very, very well represented. Your tax dollars are paid for it. And the expertise they have in a variety of cities and a variety of industry sectors uh, across Brazil is remarkable. There is also an Ontario representative and there is also a Quebec representative. So there is um, a real intention by the Canadian government to support exporters who want to look at Brazil. And we have many resources available. We have many contacts that we can share with you in order to make this happen. And I'm not saying we Mellowhawk, I'm saying we with the um, uh, Brazil Canada Chamber of Commerce, and of course, all the experts that we have here. Uh, you should go on trade missions, virtual and otherwise. You should do trade shows, and you should remember that you have the Canadian brand. And what is the Canadian brand? The Canadian brand is not cheap. But what the Canadian brand is, is quality. People believe that things made in Canada are well made. That is what you have to sell with. Uh, you have to understand why you're doing trade diversification. There is an unpredictability of our traditional markets, as we've seen with, uh, you know, our giant market uh, to the south of us, the U.S., suddenly things became problematic, and the Canadian government is out to support small business people and all business people who want to open up their markets. Um, so a couple of strategies to remember. Did you follow up with your prospects, partners, and clients after your meetings, after your contacts? Uh, if you didn't, then you're a bad boyfriend. A bad boyfriend has a great time and doesn't call, but the fact is is I have seen over and over again, I've seen the Italians, the Chinese, and the Mexicans work faster than Canadians. So Canadians must absolutely follow up and maintain contact. Um, EDC, EDC is great to help you close the sale and protect against potential loss. So remember you can insure your receivables and EDC has great contacts too in, uh, in uh, Brazil as well. And uh, it'll help you get paid. And in fact, uh, 
uh, EDC and any number of companies can help you understand how currency rates can help you. Brazil has a couple of things going for it as a business, um, a prime business location right now. Number one, its uh, money is devalued. So in fact, it is everything is a deal. But however, that's for investing in Brazil. However, it makes it harder for people to buy from outside. Uh, and so you really have to work with Brazilians to understand what it is they can pay for and how they can do their business. That said, it is a prime market because there is a warm business um, environment happening right now in Brazil um, with a real effort now to pay attention to ESG concerns, environmental concerns, governance concerns, and uh, also to make sure that uh, um, all business is coming under ethical practices. So I just wanna stress that we have a variety of concerns that you should start thinking about now if you're thinking about Brazil. If you're already in Brazil, there are some things you probably have forgotten about that you should be revisiting. And remember, we have experts all over the place who can help you. Back to you, Arno. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm gonna give a, a little update on COVID. Uh, I know I have a few minutes here, but uh, um, as you know, COVID continues to affect the world in supply chain. Uh, lack of containers, uh, what we call the equipment, in Canada, Brazil, and China creating high costs. Uh, container rates from China to North America has reached $27,000 a few weeks ago, and this is called the priority loading rate. So be careful. Some people are giving you a lower rate in some markets and saying, oh, you know, Mellow Hawk, I have this rate and that. Well, your container might sit at the port and not be loaded into a ship for weeks or months. We had that situation on, on the contract of a client of ours going to Brazil. So air freight costs, they are decreasing as flights uh, between Canada and Brazil increase. Uh, now in November to five flights a week with Air Canada and in December daily, thank God. So the rates tend to go down a little bit, but they will not be in the same rate as 2019. So expect those prices to remain until the beginning of next year, but they are decreasing slowly. Huge congestions in LA and Vancouver on, on ships coming into Canada, and as well as ships departing Canada as well. There is backlogs everywhere, especially in points of transit, uh, of transshipments of those containers. Huge lack of communication with carriers create further problems when bookings are canceled. What we're facing right now is we give you a client a booking, we do all the documents, we load the container, and then all of a sudden carriers all over the place simply cancel our bookings in the middle of the process with no explanation. There is no phone numbers to call these carriers now. Everything is done via email. It has been very, very difficult to be on top of the steamship lines, which are making billions of dollars um, on, on clients all over the world. Uh, and of course, I like to say, and I'm sorry, many steamship lines are using COVID in order to gain huge profits. Yes, there are problems. Yes, there are crews with COVID in many ships docking in Canada and the States. Uh, we heard today, I think, uh, Peter, 30, $12 billion in products stuck in the Pacific that cannot be offloaded in LA. And there's a delay of 13 days to offload the container from a ship. It there's is a huge. There's over 100 ships waiting uh who, that have arrived and are waiting for birth and that it's going to take right. 13 days for them for them to be uh, arrive at their birth and be offloaded 13 days right. two right. weeks half of the right. journey a 50 percent longer journey now as a result correct and this is uh, i'm giving we're giving those examples but th th that is happening in brazil as well and in canada and of course the news today is that Morris, one of the biggest carriers in the world is expected to announce they will only handle cargo direct uh, from direct shippers starting November 1st, cutting out freight forwarders. And here goes a warning for you as well. Uh, and a freight forwarder is a, a, a company um, that has knowledge of the market, either on imports and exports. When carriers who are not freight forwarders are trying to do the work of a freight forwarder, they will not have knowledge, for example, of some documents that are needed in Brazil to import product or in Canada or all over the world. So be careful if you're dealing directly with the steamship line because they have limited capacity when there is a problem. I consulted on a company that exported 10 containers from Brazil to Canada. Those 10 containers in the middle of the Atlantic, the importer in Canada refused the product, leaving the exporter in Brazil with 10 containers to arrive in Canada, which 
is costing them so far 625,000 reais in storage for three months at the port of Montreal. So if you face a problem somewhere, you need to bring it to the front. You need to involve a freight forwarder to help you in that market. Do not trust completely the steamship lines that are not freight forwarder in some markets. So very, very careful. And of course, Mellowhawk has created from Brazil to Canada during the pandemic, an LCL consolidation for frozen products and dry products. And soon we're gonna have a consolidation from Canada going to Brazil, uh, helping minimize costs for these uh, types of services. I invite you also to listen to our podcast, Logistics in Motion at Spotify and Apple Music. Peter and I talk about the history of Mellowhawk and give insights on, on the 19 years that we had Mellowhawk Logistics in Canada. So follow us and listen to our podcast. And finally, I'd like to say the key to success is focus, respect, integrity, and passion. We have to have all of those no matter where you do business. So thank you so much for having us. It's an honor to be here. Again, my name is Arnon Mello. Thank you. Thank you, Arno. And don't miss the interview that I did with Arno. It's been posted on the BCCC LinkedIn page a couple of days ago. He's going to go a little bit deeper, a little bit more uh, deep into the, the COVID crisis and uh, the impact. I'm still shocked with the prices of the rates. And I'm also now very disappointed at Maersk for that announcement today. So yes, exactly. shame, no good. Um, thank you so much, Arno, for the presentation. Thank you, Peter, for always uh, your incredible insights, especially the bad boyfriend syndrome. And uh, so uh, next, I would like to invite our next speaker today, Luis Ramos, Director of Market Research and Business Development at The Color Canada, to present uh, one of the, I think, most interesting topics that is how to find a partner in Brazil, sales representatives and distributor. Luis, stage is yours. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And thank you for the audience. And congratulations again to BCCC for this initiative, the fifth edition of uh, uh, doing business in Brazil. My name is Luis Ramos. I am from Da Color Canada, and I'm the Canadian arm of Da Color Brazil. Uh, I have a few dozen years of experience developing business throughout Brazil, South America, and in the last three years here in Canada with the consumer goods and IT industries, uh, especially with the retail, wholesale, uh, food service and government channels. Um, let me share my screen. I suppose everybody can see this. Huh? And before I show how the Color Brazil can help you um, in your plans to do business in Brazil, I think it's uh, essential first to bring uh, a little of the country's cultural history and how its roots were shaped in the past. So if you allow me, and far from my pretense of teaching a human history class here today, I would like to go back a little bit and remind you how was the world um, at the time of the America colonization, back in the mid of 16th century and mid of 18th century. Um, I believe uh, if we understand the cultural region of the country, we will better understand uh, the cultural environment that exists today. And at the same time, uh, um, we can also better understand the business environment that we are about to explore. Understanding this better, better and more uh, assertively we can draw strategic and tactical plans focused on the results. So, uh, sorry about that, but <laughs> are you ready for our Thursday history class? So, uh, let's go. Uh, um, the period known as the Age of uh, Enlightenment uh, in Portuguese, Illuminismo, was a philosophical movement naturally arising from the advance of the Christian reformist ideals of Calvin and Martin Luther in the sixth century, opposing uh, the, the monarch absolutism and the influence of the Roman Catholic Church uh, in medieval society. 
The Enlightenment movement marked the passage of humanity from medieval era to the modern era as we know it today. Uh, the main principles defended by the ideas of the Enlightenment and that were a direct counterpoint to the ideas in force uh, at the time were uh, humanism, have a human being at the center of the universe, a scientific uh, rationalism uh, guidance, the liberalism in the intellectual, political, economic, and, and religion fields, uh, a constitutional governance with less presence of the state in the uh, people's life, and a society based on uh, moral uh, values and uh, common goods. Um, thus, we can see in the mid 80th century European religion map on, on our left, at the height of the humanistic movement, that the uh, conservative Roman Catholic influence was still prevalent in the Atlantic Mediterranean uh, uh, Latin countries, while uh, the reformist liberalism advanced into the Anglo-Saxon countries and France, where not at least it was the credo of the Calvinist movement and where the French Revolution, uh, and where the French Revolution broke out in 1789, um, drastically changed in the monarch absolutism system of government forever. Um, knowing that the Mediterranean countries, let's say the most conservative, were responsible for the colonization of the Central and South America, especially Portugal and Spain, while the Anglo-Saxon country, let's say the more liberal, were responsible for the colonization of North America, we can already trace which are the basic European cultural profiles and backgrounds served to build the uh, society in the new world. Profiles and backgrounds that are still deeply rooted and bring cultural patterns and distinct conservative or liberal habits to these days. Um, in the case of Brazil, in addition of uh, a Portuguese colonizing immigration, there is also the strong cultural presence of the First Nations existing on the continent and the massive slave trade from Africa. Um, just opening a small uh, parenthesis, about four out of every 10 African slaves uh, had Brazil as a final destination. It means almost 40% of all global African historical trafficking, which despite the horrors of the slavery and the subjugation of the human beings, brought unique particularities to the country's cultural mix. Uh, we already know that Brazil cultural roots were molded in a predominantly conservative European pattern, as shown in the chart on the right. Even though the chart is a static image of the year of 1884, it faithfully portrays immigration as a whole. Um, predominantly conservative, Latin Mediterranean, and uh, on a scale infinitely smaller than that of Anglo-Saxon liberals. Geographically, both liberal and conservatives concentrate their landing on the Atlantic coast. Conservative were more concentrated in the tropical region, perhaps because of the similarity to the Mediterranean temperatures, while liberals further uh, south in the subtropical region, also perhaps because of the similarity of the lower temperatures in North and Central Europe. Um, once again, I'm sorry for this professorial side of me, but I'm closing to uh, the historical theme and move on to what really interests us, I promise you. Um, those geographic differences from the Brazilian colonization 
brought and still bring great difference in the regional development process, whose evolutionary flow starts from the south to the north and from the east coast to the countryside, from a more liberal social environment to an established more conservative one, which is gradually transforming itself into the same evolutionary path as the globalized society today. As the main region of different current existing in different regions of the country, and as a direct reflection of all these calls we have seen so far. We can mention some of them, remembering in advance that these are the main points that should be faced as a challenge and barriers to overcome in a market conquest process. Uh, climate uh, difference, uh, cultural and consumer habits, regional presence and dependence of the state, religious influence, economic, social, and educational development, purchasing capacity, logistics, and communication system. Since we are now aware of the why Brazil culturally has a unique business environment, and when this was shaped into its complexities, we can now move on to the how. Start with how to build a winning strategic business plan and what capabilities should we have to succeed. Be adaptable, flexible, and empathetic to turn into the local desires, possibilities, and opportunities. Understand all the complexity of the legal environment to be 100% in compliance with the local rules, regulations, laws, and bureaucracy too. Understand Brazil as a several distinct markets and not only a single one. Going deep into all research possibilities to better understand it. In the complexity of the tax system can be a good part of the opportunities for greater profitabilities and earnings. Go deep into this analysis to build your business plan. See Brazil as a logistical challenge to be overcome with several existing bottlenecks to achieve desired market coverage. Use and abuse of all possible market research and business intelligence analysis as possible. You can even maintain less flexible policies for the general market, but have a specific tactical plans for specific markets and geographic areas. Don't try to tackle the complexities presented here alone, in particular SMES companies. The chances of fail are much greater than they present. Um, my suggestion, look for partners like the caller to maximize your results and minimize your risks. And how the color can is capable and should help you in this difficult task of facing these difficulties. Uh, since in 1999, the color is working in Brazil with operational partners in Brazil, US, Canada, Europe, and China. We integrate strategies and actions through value networks with a strong dependence on alignment and communication between people and companies. We have served different industries over these 22 years. For example, durable and fast moving consumer goods, information technology and management solution, e-entertainment, market research, automation, connectivity, business intelligence, artificial intelligence, and virtual reality, water and waste treatment solution, capital goods, payment and finance solutions, clear energy generation, chemical and pharmaceutical industries. Our expertise in transforming plans into tactical actions encompasses different phases in the specific projects. During search, and then find details to, to build solid and harmonious path, building strategies, and in distribution, we weave an efficient network to deliver at the right place to the right person at the right time, planning uh, our results, 
uh, to come from the forge to know how to plan and recalculate the route if necessary during the, all this process. And participations, who uh, we participate in uh, companies uh, that really have some uh, a good opportunity to make change in the world. And our team of experts from its founders to associate departments cover several specific areas of expertise, acquisitions, incorporations, legal taxes, and accounting, uh, regulatory affairs as uh, consumer goods, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and CBD, uh, logistics distribution, management and uh, human research, finance, sales, market, trade market, and international trade. For now, and within the time available, this is what I had to expose to you. I will be happy to answer your question now in the Q&A area, and I will also be available in the breakout session following the event to personally clarify any further question that you need. Thank you everyone again, and all the best to Neil. Thank you, Luis. Thank you so much. And uh, congratulations for all the work that Color has been doing here in Canada as well with uh, bringing all the products. So next, I'd like to invite uh, our next speaker, Fabio Ferreira Kujavski, partner at Matos Filho, to present on Brazilian data protection law. Very important topic to all tech companies uh, looking into Brazil. Fabio, thank you for being here. Uh, the stage is yours. Hi, Carolina. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll try to give you a brief overview of the Brazilian legislation so that everybody can have a sense on how that applies to companies that are doing business in Brazil or with Brazilian companies. Let me briefly share my screen here. Perfect. Can you see it? Yes, thank you. Thank you. For some reason, I wasn't able to, to scroll down this slide. So we can move to, to, the, to the next one. So this is, this is a cover of the uh, Economist uh, magazine back in April 2018, uh, when a lot of uh, data protection regulations were being put in place uh, across the globe. And there was a, a sort of a shift in the, par in the, in the sense that the consumers you know, should be in charge of their own personal data, just for all you know what the Euro Europeans have been doing for quite some time. And this actually has been an inspiration for many countries to put together their, their own data privacy laws. And that was something that happened in Brazil as well. So our legislation, I think it's pretty much inspired in GDPR. Uh, and, and we'll tackle that in a second. We can go to this next one, Carolina, please. Okay, so, so in Brazil, I think it's just important for any company that is doing business in Brazil, of course, depending on which kind of business you're in. But basically, there are typically three important pieces of legislation that has to be taken into account. One is the consumer protection code. Whenever you have a sort of a product or service or a platform where you have interactions with consumers, that's a very important and, and very robust uh, consumer protection code in Brazil that was enacted actually quite many years ago. Uh, more recently, in 2014, we have the Internet Act that I think that basically rules how companies should interact and some rights and obligations with respect to Internet users. So any, any kind of online business uh, should be mindful about this uh, legislation. And more recently, in 2018, our uh, data protection law that I think it's our omnibus regulation that pretty much covers any sort of processing activity of personal data, including with respect to government Processing, uh, processing as well, which I think it's somehow different from Canada, where we have a specific legislation, the Privacy Act for government institutions, where the PIPEDA uh, is only for, for private enterprise. In Brazil, we have this, this combined um, legislation. So LGPD, as we call, applies to, to private sector and government as well. Then we can move to the, to the next one, Carolina, please. Um, yeah, so the first question you might have, well, when that act law actually applies? So it applies to any processing activity, regardless of where the company is incorporated. I think this is something important because we've been advising technology companies for quite some time. And sometimes they have the impression, well, I'm not based in Brazil, so I don't need to comply with Brazilian law. And many tech companies in the past tried to, to pursue that route. And it, and it was very uh, unsuccessful. Uh, and, that, and that also applies to, uh, to data legislation as well. So even if you're not based in Brazil, but you're offering services 
to and to individuals in Brazil, if you're collecting data uh, coming from Brazil, or if the data subject you know, that you are collecting data is in Brazil, in all those circumstances, the Brazilian law will apply. Of course, that we have a lot of discussions with respect to enforceability of the Brazilian law to, to, you know, to foreign-based companies. This is always a challenge, but it happens and we have some examples of company that breached Brazilian data privacy law and actually uh, was, uh, was uh, subject to the Brazilian legislation. So that happens not all the time, but there is, there is a potential risk. So we can, we can move to the next one, Carolina. Uh, and then, uh, you know, some, some very basic definitions I think we have in Brazil definition of uh, personal data that sometimes it's pretty much similar to the PIPEDA, which is the uh, Canadian uh, data privacy legislation, but we do have uh, a definition of sensitive data which is something that the Canadian law doesn't do. Uh, so any data that is considered to be um, that, that concerns to racial or ethnic origin like religious belief, political opinion, um, you know, political organization membership, you know, uh, health information, sexual orientation, genetic and biometric data, this is deemed to be sensitive data. And under Brazilian law, there are more restrictions for any controller to process sensitive data. So basically, there are two types of data. There is the focus of Brazilian law, uh, personal uh, data and sensitive data. Anonymized data, it's not relevant for Brazilian law. So the Brazilian data laws will not apply to anonymized data. Then we can move to, to I'm just trying to very, very briefly uh, give you some of because there are many things to talk about and try to be as effective as, as I can in terms of giving you the basic, uh, you know, parameters of the Brazilian legislation. Then, of course, we can tackle into some of the questions in a breakup session, uh, you know, following the presentation. Then uh, another very important piece of the Brazilian law and, and any other data privacy law is the principles of data processing. I think here we also have a lot of things in common with PIPEDA. I just highlighted some of them that are different. Uh, so, to, so very uh, you know, briefly, uh, you need to uh, ensure that you comply with all those principles, including, for example, you need to have a valid purpose for, for processing data. Uh, you have to process data in a way that is adequate. You have to process data whenever you have actually the need to process that, that data. Uh, data subjects that have free access to their data at any time. You need to ensure that the data you're, you're processing is, is accurate. You have to be transparent in your policies and explain to data subjects how you use their data. You need to employ security and prevention mechanisms, mechanisms to avoid the data from being leaked uh, or unauthorized access to that data. We have actually one specific to Brazil, which is the non-discrimination. So, I mean, controllers are not allowed to process data in a way that the result of that processing could imply in an unlawful discrimination to the data subjects that are subject to that processing activity. And finally, accountability. So we have a robust you know, chapter in our law that deals with responsibilities and accountability of the processing agents. It's interesting to see that, that in Canada and PIPEDA, we do have uh, constant as a, as a principle of, of data processing, which is sort of unique. Uh, and you also have the challenge in compliance, which is something that, of course, we also do have in Brazil, but not as a principle, but pretty much as a data privacy, as, as a data subjects right. We'll tackle that in a second. So we can move to the next one, Carolina. Very good. So, uh, well, not, not everything is bad news. When the Brazilian law was first enacted back in 2018, there was a lot of discussion saying, well, now, now that's the end of the world. We won't be able to process information anymore. Everything is just bad news. And this is not true. Uh, just so you know, uh, for online processing operate, you know, activities uh, based on the 2014 Internet Act, there's only one available uh, lawful basis, which is consent. There's nothing else there. Now we know with the, the new uh, data protection law, we now have like 10 other legal bases for controllers to choose and to justify their, their, you know, their processing operations. So very briefly, consent, of course, it's, uh, it's one of them. If the controller has to comply with legal regulatory obligations, we have, for example, um, public administration is allowed to process uh, personal data for carrying out public policies. Uh, research organizations can also process personal data for conducting studies. 
Um, then performance of contracts, that's another very important uh, legal basis. So if you need to perform a contract of, or if you're about to execute a contract, you know, in the preliminary discussions and procedures with respect to a contract, you can justify the processing operations. If you need to, in a controller, to exercise rights in lawsuits, administrative or arbitration proceedings, another possibility to protect life or health, legitimate interest, and protection of credit. In Canada, we see there's a lot of weight on the consent. Of course, there are many circumstances where the preparer releases controllers from having to seek consent. Uh, but I think, uh, at least in Brazil, and I think that following more closely to GDPR, we do have all these uh, lawful grounds. And, and what we basically say is that you have to have one, you don't have to have, have more than one. But if you cannot justify the processing activities based on at least one legal base, that's probably a reason for you to reconsider if that's an information that your company could still have in its systems. Then we can go to the next one, Carolina, please. Very good. Well, then we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, data subjects rights, express rights that, uh, you know, that's actually the first time that a federal law in Brazil actually dealt with data subject rights. So very briefly, you know, any data subject has the right to know whether or not a company is processing information. Um, and the access to the data has to be uh, uh, provided in 15 days. And a lot of controllers saying, well, this is too short. Can we get an extension? We need to validate if the data subject is actually the data subject entitled to receive that information. But all we have so far is, you know, 15 days is the time that a controller needs to hand over information with respect to their data processing activities in case there is a data subject request. The data subjects are allowed to correct, anonymize, and block data, ask for data portability. For example, if you want to, I don't know, change a you know, supplier or a service provider, you are allowed, or even an employer, uh, you are allowed to actually get your information and transfer to somebody else. Uh, you have the right to withdraw consent so that your information is deleted if that's processed under you know the consent legit uh, legitimate basis uh, you are allowed to know all the sharing operations and this is pretty tricky because companies i would say that in brazil and elsewhere I'll do a lot of data sharing and now you need to you know to explain which kind of sharing transactions you did um, so we have to be careful about that uh, you need to inform the data subject the consequences, for example, if you ask for a consent and the data subject denies, or if there is a withdrawal of consent at some point in time, you need to inform the consequences. The data subjects are also allowed to you know, have automated decisions reviewed. That was another interesting discussion in the legislative process of the Brazilian law. Uh, so, and this is, you know, for profiling, you know, for credit bureau, a lot of companies do automated decisions and uh, data subjects have the right to ask a, re a review of that decision to the extent that their interest may be affected out of those decisions. And finally, something that is not available in, in all jurisdictions, but in Brazil, individuals can file uh, lawsuits directly against controllers for violation of their rights. It's a private right of action. Um, in addition, of course, to collection act, you know, collecting actions like you know, uh, class actions that could be filed by public prosecutors and other and others uh, with respect to potential violations of the Brazilian legislation. We can move to the next one, Carolina, please. Uh, very briefly here, uh, children's uh, data. Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, you know, parent consent is required for processing data of children below 12. In Canada, I think it's below 13. And apparently in Canada, PIPED also requires consent from teenagers between uh, 13 uh, and 18. And in Brazil, this is not required. So this is pretty much the difference with respect to PIPEDA when it comes to uh, processing children's information. Then we can, we can move to the next one. Another requirement of the Brazilian law deals with, uh, uh, with the DPO, the data protection officer. Uh, the controllers have to nominate a data protection officer. Uh, it's the person uh, or the entity that will liaise uh, with data subjects and with the Brazilian Data Protection Authority. Um, it could be outsourced, doesn't have to be an officer. And, uh, and that uh, person or legal entity will be responsible for accepting the complaints, ensuring that the companies are 
educated and the employees are educated about the policies, the restrictions. Uh, as I said, we'll liaise, you know, with the authorities and, uh, and at the end, we will ensure that data privacy is dealt in a way that is, um, that is at least, you know, incorporated into the company's uh, culture, which I think it's something new. And just so you know, uh, all that, although I mean it's a 2018 legislation for Brazil, data privacy is something still pretty new, differently from other jurisdictions that have been regulations around privacy for, for quite some time. In Brazil, we just had a specific legislation on data privacy in a specific sector, like you know, banking, telecommunications, uh, and you know, and, and consumer, uh, 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 you know, confidentiality of consumer data. But you know, in, in, in of course, you know, professional service like you know. Uh, uh, you, know, you know, physicians or, or, or medical treatment, all that, of course, it's, uh, you know, even lawyers are subject to, you know, specific secrecy, professional secrecy. But apart from that, uh, LGPD is actually the first, you know, comprehensive federal law, you just, just go across sectors. So that's why, I mean, we don't have the culture in Brazil yet of, of handling, uh, uh, you know, data in a way that is now, uh, that is now law based on LGPD. So it's something new and we, uh, we assisted many companies in their compliance programs to put everything together. And was, as you can imagine, it's still um, a, a challenge, you know, to most companies to comply because the standards came from uh, very low to very robust, you know, following GDPR standards, you know, for Brazilian companies that was, and it still is sort of a challenge to ensure compliance with all the nuances of the Brazilian law. We can, we can move to the next one. All right, uh, international data transfers. Uh, that's also, uh, you know, a chapter in our Brazilian law. So you can, of course, transfer data outside Brazil, but you need to follow some rules and some standards. And the problem we face is that we do have a Brazilian new authority, uh, a data protection authority, uh, that has to regulate a lot of things. I mean, you have to determine which countries are deemed adequate, has to approve standard contractual clauses, binding corporate rules. I mean, there are many things that depend upon the Brazilian authority that have unfortunately hasn't been done yet. So what we've been advising our clients is, you know, to follow pretty much, you know, the existing templates, uh, the BCRs, the SECs that have been approved by European authorities, because I think that's a good start. Uh, but this is, I think it's, it's still a challenge based on the fact that the, the Brazilian authority just recently became um, active in, in Brazil and ensuring that you have data processing agreements in place uh, whenever you're transferring data in and out of Brazil or from Canada to Brazil and vice versa. I think it's, it's very important. We can move to the next one. I think my time is almost, uh, almost finishing. So let's see what else we have. Yeah, sanctions very briefly. I think that uh, uh, Brazilian law, you know, is, is pretty uh, tough, not as tough as GDPR, but apparently uh, tougher than PIPEDA when it comes to fines. Uh, so for violation of the law, we have 2% of uh, uh, before tax turnover uh, of the company in the uh, previous fiscal year, but limited to like 10 million US per infraction, per violation. There may be some other sanctions like you know, blocking, uh, suspension of, of data processing activities and, and other stuff. And the Brazilian authority, I think it's becoming more sophisticated to launch Let's say uh, you know investigations for a breach of of those uh, of those requirements. We can move to I think it's now it's the last one. No, it's uh, okay. Data breach notification requirements. I think it's pretty similar to what we have in Pipeda. So there is a sort of a materiality threshold. So not all uh, data incidents are reportable. Only those that can present relevant risk or relevant damage to to, to the data subjects. You have to be provided in a reasonable time. You don't have the 72 hour clock of, G of GDPR, uh, but you need to explain, you know, explain what happened, you know, what were the category of information that might have been compromised, what have been the mitigating, uh, you know, measures taken to reduce risks. And, and in Brazil, you need to inform the data subjects and the Brazilian authority. There is no differently from GDPR, for example, where you're able to not notify one or not the other. In Brazil, apparently, it's just like, you know, the two of them must be subject to a notification whenever you're talking about a notifiable breach. And then finally, uh, Carolina, I hope I'm still uh, on time. Uh, a good news is that we have recently uh, a public consultation by the Brazilian authority trying to alleviate some of those uh, obligations to uh, small business and to startups. 
Uh, it's still not final yet, uh, but received a lot of comments from everybody. So the idea, is, as I said, is to try to alleviate some of this burden. So some of the rights available for data subjects uh, may not be granted by uh, small business and startups. Uh, you have more time to reply for requests. Uh, you don't need to appoint a DPO, a data protection officer. You don't need to have records of processing. So, so in a way to try to make the lives of those uh, emerging companies and small business less complicated when it comes to compliance with the Brazilian data protection law. I'll stop here, I think probably much I'm on time and I'll be glad to take any, uh, any questions in the breakout room. So thank you so much for the opportunity again. Thank you, Fabio, for a very uh, uh, clear presentation. I think it's really always good to see how Brazil compares to Canada, especially for the Canadian audience here. So thank you very much for the, for the presentation. Fabio will be available for the breakout sessions. We're kind of like a little bit delayed on time. So I'm gonna invite our next speaker, Jose Guilherme, uh, um, uh, Jose Guilherme Berman, partner at, Matos, at uh, PMA Law to talk about uh, uh, doing business with the Brazilian government. I think that uh, uh, Eduardo mentioned before, there's new regulations coming in uh, on how to deal for, how foreign investors can deal with the Brazilian government, how to build a relationship, how to sell your product. So Zaguilermi, uh, stage is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Carolina. I promise uh, I have a very short presentation. So I think I, I will not take uh, much of your time. And as Eduardo anticipated, we do have a new uh, public bidding law. So this is uh, partly good news because uh, here in Brazil, we used to have one general law that was enacted in 1993, okay? So let me just share my screen here. So here, okay. Now, can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes, okay. So. Uh, in Brazil, to contract with the government, uh, the general rule is that a public bidding is required. This is a constitutional rule, so it is uh, mandatory to have public biddings. Since 1988, uh, both from the direct administration, which is uh, state, federal, and municipal governments, uh, and also to contract with uh, uh, state-owned companies like Petrobras, Banco do Brasil, our uh, state-owned companies that can have uh, part of the, the shares under private control. They are considered private entities, but they are submitted to few rules from public law. And one of these rules is the requirement of uh, public bidding to enter into contracts. And as I said, uh, this is a constitutional requirement since 1988. And our law was from 1993. And it was a, a very complex law and not very friendly to foreign companies to take part here because the law in, in 1993 required that foreign companies was previously authorized to work in Brazil to take part in public bidding. So only when the government choose to have uh, international biddings, the foreign companies were allowed to take part. And this is a, a very important change in the new law that was enacted in April 1st, now in 2021. And now anyone, uh, any company from anywhere can take part in the bid. So this is a very important change to foreign investors and foreign companies that uh, are willing to enter into contracts with the Brazilian government. And one thing that uh, is very, very complex in Brazil is that we are, as Canada, a federal state, and we have three levels of government here. So we have the federal government, what we call uh, Union Federal, the federal union. We have 27 states, plus the federal district. And I know that uh, you have only 10 provinces in Canada. And we have also more than 5,000 municipalities and they all can run their own public bids. But the good news is that uh, the legislation about public bidings and public contracts, it belongs 
uh, it's a power that belongs to the federal government. It's, so it's a federal law. We have actually uh, more than one federal law, but the, the main one is the new law, the 14133, that was enacted in April, as I said. Um, <clears throat> so there, there are few exceptions, also few situations in which a uh, company can enter directly uh, without public bidding into contract with the government. Uh, situations like a, a very high complex uh, contract, so something that uh, only one company can provide. There is uh, no way to, to, to run a competition, but these are of course exceptions. And the other path that uh, companies can, can try to, to, to follow to enter into contracts in Brazil, is acquiring uh, company, Brazilian companies that has contracts with the government or acquiring the contract themselves. So you can transfer a public contract, either a, a public contract for uh, the acquisition of goods for service uh, to, to render services or to construction works with the government, but also concession uh, contracts, which are more complex contracts public concessions like sewage, like electricity, like uh, telecommunications, stuff like that. These are considered public services. They must be rendered by the state or by private companies, uh, but they need to, to win a public bid to have the, the, the concession contract. So uh, it is possible to, to, to transfer this concession con contract to private companies. We have a, a recent example here. In Sao Paulo, one uh, subway line was being built by a private company here in Brazil, a Brazilian company uh, involved in the car wash scandal. And they were trying, they was trying to, to, to sell the, the construction and the concession contracts. And a Spanish group uh, uh, bought with the, the the government of Sao Paulo approval. So this is a, a way to, to not to, to be subject to a public bidding, but this is a situation that is, that is currently under discussion before the Supreme Court. Uh, we have a very important trial on course and two ministers from the Supreme Court already uh, placed their votes considering that you cannot transfer a public concession because it must be performed by the company that uh, won the public bidding. And these two votes were, were very uh, controversial here. Uh, and I hope that uh, they will be defeated at the end of the judgment, uh, especially because this law, the concessions law, uh, was enacted in 1995. So more than, than 25 years ago, and several uh, situations are already uh, consolidated and it will be very hard to, to undo what was done uh, up to now. But let's see, this is a, a, a case that uh, we are following close because it affects the interest of many of our clients here. So the general rule, as I said, is always to have a public bid. We have uh, four phases in the bidding. The first one, the preparatory phase, used to be called uh, internal phase, is uh, it occurs inside the public administration without the participation of private companies as a rule. There is a few situations that the private companies may discuss with the public administration the terms of the public bidding, but uh, it's not usual uh, normally the public administration has people that uh, develop the projects, the specifications, uh, the call for tender, and then after everything is done, uh, the notice of the bid is, uh, became, be, become public. And this is when the private companies can uh, look at the terms, make questions, uh, and even discuss with the public administration if there is something, something wrong. Then they have a bidding session phase, like an auction, depending of how the bidding will be uh, conducted. We have uh, 
five, five ways of conducting beatings, but uh, the most common here now is called pregão, which, which is uh, like an auction with open uh, dispute. And then the final phase is the qualification, is when the public administration look at the participants and, see, well, actually it looks only to the winner and say if the winner uh, attend to all the requirements. If not, they call the second place and uh, until they found someone that that can uh, that can perform the, the contract. So as I said, uh, the new public bidding law, 14.133, was enacted in April, and it opens to the participation of foreign companies. So this is one of the sections of the law, and it says that according to the terms of this law, the public notice may not establish conditions of qualification, classification, and judgment that constitute barriers of access to foreign bidders, admitting the provision of a margin of preference for goods produced in Brazil and national services that meet Brazilian technical standards as defined in the article 26 of the same law. So except for this margin of preference, which is not a rule, also it can be established that it's not a rule, uh, the public bid cannot forbid a foreign company to participate. So this is, as I said, a, a very important difference between the old law, the 1993 law, and the 2021 law. So uh, even though the new law is not fully in force now, we are in a transition moment because the law was enacted in April, but it, uh, the same law says that the public administration may choose to conduct biddings up to 2023 for two years under the 1993 law, which is the law number 8666. So it is indeed more common, uh, like uh, six months now with the, the new law already enacted, but the public administration continues to, to run bids under the 8666 law because uh, it's what they know, it's easier for them to use the, the old law, but we have a, a more one and a half year only, and then the new law will be mandatory. So every public bid in two years will be conducted under the 14133 law. And this is good because uh, the law changes not only the public bidding process, uh, making it less complex. It, it's still a complex process, but less than the 8666, 8666 uh, process. And it changes also uh, the legal framework of the administrative contracts, not, the, not only the public bids, but also the contracts that are enacted after the bidding with the, the winner of the tender. And in Brazil, uh, administrative contracts, they have a, a specific legal framework, which uh, enables the public administration to hold some powers uh, that um, make the public, that put the public administration in a position that uh, is higher than the position of the private. So the private company hired by the, the public administration is obliged to comply with, uh, for instance, uh, a delay in the payment, and they cannot uh, stop to, to provide a good and, or the asset uh, hired. The old law, the old law, the 1993 law, uh, predicts a 90-day period, and the new law reduced to 60 days. So it is better to a private contract uh, I'm sorry, it is a, it's better to a private company to sign a contract under the new law, not only because of uh, uh, such change, but also other changes, uh, including the, the, the term of the, the period of the contract. In, in the 1993 law, uh, any service could be rendered only for up to five years. And now, depending on the service, it may reach 10 or 15 years. Uh, according to the, the kind of contract that is uh, signed. 
Uh, so as I said, now the new law doesn't require a foreign company to, to have a legal authorization, but if the company uh, is uh, wins the public tender, it will have to, to sign the contract. And then uh, the most common ways, and in the previous, uh, the previous speakers already uh, say that, the most common ways to sign the contract is to opening a Brazilian subsidiary or forming a, a JV or a consortium with a Brazilian company. The old law said that uh, in consortiums, the Brazilian law, the Brazilian company must be the, the leader of the consortium, but the new law doesn't provide that. Um, as I said, the foreign companies are, are entitled to the same rights of Brazilian companies. So they have equal rights, except for the margin of preference that can reach up to 10 or 20% in the competition. The 20% rate is uh, an exception to innovative innovation uh, contracts. And about the publicity of the contracts, uh, this is also a major change because the new law created a website called the PNCP, Portal Nacional de Contratações Públicas, uh, that entered, uh, started to work, I don't know, uh, maybe two weeks ago, doesn't have many information now about public meetings, but in two years, this uh, website, PNCP, will be the, the, the only channel, uh, not the only, but the main channel uh, to, to make public the tenders uh, conducted by all the public administration in Brazil, federal, state, and municipal. So this is a very uh, important change because to anyone, including foreign companies, the best way to know uh, the opportunities, to know what are the opportunities to contract with Brazilian government in all levels will be the, the website, the PNCP. Uh, if a company wants to approach government officials to, to offer their, ser their services, this is not uh, very common in an uh, ordinary, services and construction works and something like that, because the public administration uh, always uh, communicate to the public with public tenders, what are the opportunities. Uh, but of course, anyone is allowed to, to, to try to reach out to government authorities and to try to make a roadshow, a presentation, something like that. What we do recommend is that uh, you follow compliance uh, precautions, me uh, measures, like having more than one person from each side, if possible, uh, to report the meeting, have a formal schedule, uh, and etc. And as uh, uh, exceptions, we also have uh, two ways in uh, through to, to private companies to speak to the public authorities what they are thinking and what they think that can be a good opportunity. So you can offer services to public government, but usually this happens in very complex issues, innovative discussions. One of them is the PMI, what's called Procedimento uh, Manifestação de Interesse. It's an expression of interest procedure. Uh, and in this case, the private sector can uh, make the, the, the projects of a public concession, of a public, public contract, and submit them to the public administration. But the public administration will have to run a tender, okay, to hire the company to execute this project. And if the company that uh, creates the project doesn't win the tender, then the winner must pay for the costs incurred by the, the company that expressed the interest in this case. So this is one, one way to go to government and, and say, hey, you have a good opportunity here. And the other one is uh, brand new. I, I'm not sure if there is uh, one single example right now. It's a new way to, to conduct tenders. It's called competitive dialogue. It's inspired in the uh, European, uh, in the European Institute 
that uh, allows the public administration to discuss with several uh, companies uh, the specification and the solution. So the public administration present the problem and the private companies can discuss with the public government possible uh, solution, solutions to this problem. Uh, this is brand new, as I said. Uh, after the dialogue, the public administration will have to, to write a, a request for a proposal and to perform a tender, but uh, is a way to have this kind of dialogue with public authorities that can be very interesting, uh, depending on how it will work. And of course, we have a, we are uh, currently going on very, very, very large transformations here. Of course, car wash has a, a major impact here, but one of the one of the outcomes is to is an attempt to make the, our public contracts more friendly and more open to foreign investors. So I think we'll have uh, many opportunities for foreign companies to make public contracts here in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you. for the presentation. Uh, uh, very interesting as well. And I think that's also a big market for, for Canadian companies, right? To sell directly to the government, especially with all the Canadian investments going into Brazil, that could be an opportunity. So thank you so much for, for your presentation. And last, I would like to invite Alicia Kaznar, human rights and ESG expert at Prativa Results to present on ESG and in procurement in Brazil. As mentioned before, Alice will not be able to join us for the breakout session. So if you have any specific questions for her, please add to the Q&A box and we'll make sure uh, or do your best to, to answer them. And uh, we're also adding in the chat the link for the breakout session. Uh, so don't miss it. It's a great opportunity for you guys to connect directly with the experts uh, who can answer all your questions. So thank you, Alice, for being here. And uh, it's uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, Carolina. Um, just to confirm, you can see my presentation, right? Perfect. Um, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I'm Alisa Kagna, and I'm an expert consultant at uh, Proactiva Consultancy Firm. I want to first um, start by thanking BCCC for this opportunity um, to be here and share some ideas with you today. I'm the last speaker of the day, but I'm uh, going to talk about a very strategic topic. Um, so I ask you to please bear with me, and I hope that by the end of this presentation, um, you'll have uh, had relevant insights on ESG matters in Brazil. So um, Proactiva is a Brazilian-based uh, consultancy firm that advises corporate clients on ESG, sustainability, sustainable finance, and human rights. Um, these are some of our clients and partners. Uh, we have been advising companies in different sectors for, for the last five years, uh, especially uh, companies in risk-prone sectors. And we also have worked with uh, sectoral and multi-stakeholder organizations that are active in Brazil and Latin America. So now coming back to the, to the theme of our presentation today, um, I'll explain that I expanded a bit on the title um, I'll talk about supply chains so we can have a broader look on what is being done along supply chains in Brazil. I, I feel that when we speak about procurement, we focus on companies buying procedures only, while speaking about supply chains um, help us to have a better understanding of um, the ESG risks that are in the minds of companies um, when they're looking down at their supply chains, when they're looking at how their supply chains are structured, how they're planning to source products and services from different suppliers in different regions. So this is basically the idea. And so my objective today is to give you a very, very brief overview of ESG trends um, that are starting to impact supply chains in Brazil. Of course, ESG is a very broad theme. We're talking here about environment, social and governance um, issues. So of course I had to streamline this, um, this presentation also so we don't run over time. Um, and to do this, I'll go through the um, current ESG context in Brazil um, and then how main ESG trends that we see in the international market um, that we also see in Canada, for instance, how these trends are applying to Brazil. And then I'm gonna go into um, a few good practices that we see um, that are being adopted in supply chains here in Brazil. 
So before we begin um, talking about ESG, I think it's important to distinguish here uh, between strict uh, legal compliance regarding environmental, social, and governance matters and ESG governance as a strategic and value adding approach to businesses, right? I think my, my peers here did an amazing uh, work in explaining um, different compliance aspects that are very relevant for Canadian firms that want to um, find partners in Brazil. I'll have a more uh, strategic look into how ESG can, can also become um, a value for Canadian companies. So if a company is interested in supplying Brazilian corporations with goods and services, the first step is to understand what are the legal requirements in terms of um, env environmental, sanitary, social regulations. Um, and then, uh, of course, some sectors are more regulated than others, especially risk prone sectors such as mining and energy. The food and beverage industry also has um, specific um, sanitary and quality uh, regulations that are very important. But if we go beyond um, legal compliance, uh, when we talk about the ESG agenda, we see that um, it is raising new questions as how how to companies um, how companies are managing and reporting on their environmental, social, and governance risks. So. Um, in order to set standards for companies, different frameworks were created. And um, these frameworks and parameters, and I bring some of them here in the slides, um, they tend to be voluntary. So these are uh, voluntary measures, right, uh, that the companies are adopting. But we also see a trend in, um, in some governments finding inspiration in these sorts of uh, frameworks to when, when issuing new uh, regulations in these areas. So this is an important trend um, and I'll talk more about it later. Um, and many of the frameworks that I presented here in the slide are being applied in Brazil. We see that they help to set the, the tone for companies. They give parameters for investors and other stakeholders in terms of uh, what to expect regarding ESG matters. Um, and some of them, of course, bring important considerations as to how companies manage and should disclose their ESG risks in their supply chains. Um, so this is, this is going to be a very short presentation. I won't be able to um, talk about all of them, but I'll try to give you uh, an overview of what's going on in Brazil in terms of ESG, okay? Um, so coming to the ESG context in Brazil, um, this is an actual, actually really interesting moment for the advancement of the ESG agenda um, in the country. There, there are different forces pushing the agenda forward in Brazil. Um, even though we sometimes get bombarded with news, uh, news reports that show quite the opposite. So um, on one side, you, have, you can see um, that the Brazilian private sector's image has suffered uh, from a series of episodes that have had consequences uh, for the environment and people. Some of these episodes got widespread attention from international media, and you have probably heard of them. Um, for instance, we had uh, mining disasters in the last year that had last years that have affected um, communities and workers and the environment. There were also long-lasting investigations on corruption cases um, involving construction companies and politicians. Um, and uh, in the last two years, we've seen civil society organizations become very vocal um, and carry out investigations on the links between deforestation and activities in the Amazon, right? So as a consequence of all these factors, um, there is increased pressure over pri the private sector in Brazil to show that companies are in line with sustainable development. And the pressure, of course, is especially stronger in the case of larger companies or sector leaders that are more subject to, to scrutiny from, um, from third parties, from their stakeholders. So on the other side, uh, we see that uh, the ESG agenda um, has been uh, um, internalized in Brazil and um, stakeholders are taking action quickly. For instance, um, in the at least 13 Brazilian companies were recognized by the Sustainability Yearbook uh, 2021 prepared by SP and Global. Um, the yearbook analyzed more than 7,000 companies that participate in the Dow Jones uh, Sustainability Index. Um, and to participate in the ranking, companies must score among the best 15% in their sector. So this means that we have um, quite a few Brazilian companies, larger companies um, standing out for their sustainability measures. 
We also notice a consistent high number of large companies uh, reporting on ESG matters. Uh, in Brazil, there's a recent study from 2020 that identified that Brazil scored above the global average with 85% of the country's top 100 um, companies by revenue reporting on their operations. And as I will explain in more details, the resident stock market is considered a pioneer in ESG standards. Now, moving on to the main, main trends. Um, for, for the reasons that I explained uh, before, we see that, um, and also because Brazil is, is an important actor in international trade, we see that the development of the, the ESG agenda in Brazil is happening at a fast pace. Uh, the, the main trends that we see um, in the international scenario are, are also expanding in the country and requiring companies to make fast um, changes. These trends are, are spurred by different actors. Um, I bring some of them here in the slides, such as investors, commercial partners, consumers, civil society, and uh, governments. Um, if we look at the first box here, we have, for instance, uh, consumers. As in international markets, we have new studies in Brazil showing that uh, there's a growing interest from consumers for sustainable products and brands. And we also see um, higher demands uh, of transparency. And depending, so depending on, on your business interests, it, would, it could be interesting to also learn more about consumer behavior in Brazil, what kind of niches are, um, are forming, that could be interesting to, depending on how to, to target your products in Brazil. Now in the second box, we have, as I mentioned before, we have civil society, which have been very active, uh, requiring better commitments uh, on companies, um, making evaluations and asking for more, tr more transparency. Um, of course, companies operating in different sectors and of different sizes, they will feel pressures differently. Um, how fast companies are integrating these aspects also depend on their position in the supply chain. For instance, if a company um, is in, in retailing, such as supermarket chains, they will be more aware of consumer preferences and civil society campaigns. Companies that are publicly listed or rely on international funds, they're going to be um, feeling the changes directly from banks or investors, especially um, international investors um, in Brazil. So um, the third box actually refers to, um, to supply chains. And we have also noticed an increased um, demand and interest on transparency and to know how companies are managing ESG risks in their supply chains. So stakeholders are starting uh, to no not only ask about the larger uh, downstream companies, what they're doing, but also trying to understand how the whole supply chain is um, acting or performing in terms of sustainability. So this is actually um, a very interesting um, aspect um, for smaller uh, and medium companies because, so it's when we speak about um, supply chains, this is where um, it becomes very clear that ESG um, is bringing important changes, not, for, not only for the larger companies, but also for medium and small enterprises that want to find new um, commercial partners. So in this way, it would be interesting um, for um, a company that wants to um, do business in Brazil to understand uh, what sectors are in the spotlight, what kind of good practices are being uh, adopted in certain sectors or in, in, the, in the sector of interest. Um, this could definitely help gain um, strategic information that could allow better access to markets and also bargain better prices. So now going into um, examples of regulation that I was talking about, uh, we see that some of the voluntary measures um, that uh, refer to ESG risks are now being transformed into mandatory regulation. Um, when we look uh, to the international scenario, we see, for instance, um, a trend, especially in Europe, of countries adopting legislations regarding, for instance, uh, human rights due diligence, transparency, and reporting, uh, matters that were previously established in the UN Guiding Principles on Human Rights, which is a non-binding UN document. So because these um, new legislations now impose that companies um, have to act with due diligence regarding human rights risks in their supply chains, 
These laws could, of course, generate uh, new requirements on Brazilian companies that sell to these countries or that have partners within um, European um, countries. In the Brazilian context, we also see a few uh, regulatory advances, um, but they're majorly in the financial sector, um, for instance, aiming to strengthen uh, how banks are managing their ESG risks. Um, recent, very recently, last month, Brazil Central Bank uh, published a set of norms um, regarding the management of social environmental uh, risks, and then including also climate risks. Um, Brazilian banks, they, they were already required to consider these types of risks uh, since 2014, but this time the central bank made it more clear, what um, made the meaning of these risks more clear, also giving examples on how to report these types of risks. Um, and larger banks will, will also be required to carry out climate change stress uh, tests to help them evaluate risks. There's also other important regulations uh, published by the central bank um, to help clarify environmental and social conditions um, that farmers must fulfill to be able to take loans from banks. I won't go deep into this now, but the whole idea of bringing here this, um, these regulations is to explain that um, there are um, expectations in the market that um, by making these, these norms stronger, by raising the bar uh, for banks, um, that banks will probably have to require more information from their clients. And then uh, this will probably um, have an, um, set the mood, set a trend in terms of um, transparency and reporting in the private sector. And then, um, as I mentioned before, B3, which is Brazil's uh, stock exchange, uh, is seen as a pioneer in integrating um, the SG agenda in the financial sector. Already in 2005, B3 created the Corporate Sustainability Index, which we call EASY, um, which was then the world's fourth uh, index of its type and the first one in Latin America. From then on, um, B3 has increased its portfolio of uh, ESG indices uh, to six. So they have indices on corporate governance, uh, one that tracks climate change, and another one which is more uh, general ESG aspects. Um, so EASY is an index where um, top companies in terms of liquidity are invited to answer a questionnaire. Uh, they answer a series of questions on how they're managing environmental, social, uh, climate, and other risks, including how they're doing, how they're approaching risks across their supply chains. So every year, B3 publishes uh, the portfolio of companies that were selected. Um, so this is actually a good source of information for um, companies that are interested on uh, to see which Brazilian companies are advancing and pushing forward the sustainability agenda. Um, and then it's also important to say that together, for instance, the companies that were selected in 2020 for the EASY uh, portfolio, they represent almost 40% uh, of the total market value of shares that were um, traded in B3. So it's actually um, uh, quite a uh, relevant group of companies that are um, interested in the, in the ESG standards. Um, we can also say that increase in the number of companies answering the easy every year uh, is a sign of growing interest from companies in showcasing their achievements and also a sign that the ESG agenda is maturing in the country. I will skip um, this slide so we don't we don't miss too much time and I'll go already to I think the, the core of my presentation, which is um, to talk about the good practices um, in, in supply chains that we notice in Brazil. So um, because of these trends that I outlined here for you, we see that more and more Brazilian companies are starting to ask if their supply chains are sustainable, if they're in line with the company's um, commitments and also with their strategies. Um, as I mentioned before, Brazil has been in the spotlight for different ESG um, impacts, right? So environmental issues. Brazil is a country that is very, um, whose economy is very based on, on commodities. Brazil is also a very unequal country um, with uh, high levels of social inequality, 
So certain aspects of uh, working conditions, uh, child labor, et cetera, are still um, risks that, are, that should be considered in supply chains. Um, so we see that companies are trying to gather more information on their own suppliers and also learning how to engage with them to achieve better supply chains. So uh, we noticed that companies that aspire to become sustainability leaders in their sectors are adopting uh, good practices to manage these risks. Um, and depending on the sector, we also see that, for instance, resident suppliers, uh, normally smaller suppliers, are still not that used to some, to some of these measures or to this kind of engagement. Um, in general, measures uh, will begin with the creation of an ESG governance structure. Um, companies will adopt policies and commitments, including commitments in their supply chains. And then uh, regarding risk management, management in supply chains, company might take different measures depending on their sectors. But a common practice is to start with the adoption of a supplier code of conduct with minimum ESG requirements for suppliers. In some sectors, for instance, in the textile and agriculture or in the food and beverage supply chains, we see that leading companies uh, start by requiring their suppliers to obtain third party certifications or to conduct third party um, audits. And in sectors where environmental impacts are of high concern, such as um, deforestation in the agricultural sector, we notice that there's uh, the increased use of technology to map suppliers and trace volumes. Um, and as I have mentioned before, there are high rates of reporting among large and larger Brazilian companies, and this involves also reporting uh, how, co how companies are managing risks um, in their supply chains, where they source goods and products, what kind of engagements they have um, with, their, with their suppliers, and for instance, the per percentage of products that are being certified. So now to my... Uh, conclusions from uh, everything that I've said here, um, we see that many sectors in Brazil are being encouraged to improve ESG performance. Um, of course, there are still variations across sectors and uh, companies are voluntarily embracing ESG factors. Um, from what we have seen um, of the changes in ESG agenda um, that are applied to supply chains, um, ESG is not a matter only for big companies. Supply chain risks uh, calls all buyers and suppliers to collaborate and, and work together um, across the many aspects um, of supply chains where they can find, ri find risks sin uh, since the production, logistics, processing until distribution. Um, and requirements regarding uh, suppliers' ESG performance will also vary across sectors, but um, can definitely become a competitive strategy for suppliers when approaching specific companies and sectors. So I hope I brought interesting insights for you and I didn't run too much over time. I won't be able to stay for the breakout sessions, but I'm leaving here my email and I'll be glad to answer questions that might come up. Thank you so Thank much. You. ESG is such an important uh, uh, factor nowadays, especially when you're talking about supply chain. And uh, I think we'll be organizing more and more discussions into the topic in the future um, with our ESG committee that is also chaired by Rafael Benke from Proactiva Results. So thank you, Alice, for, for being here. I'd like to thank all the speakers, all guests for the participation. I'd also like to uh, um, thank all our sponsors Vale, Mellohawk Logistics, Export Development Canada, Tiscon Barrier, Brookfield Lending Mining, and the TMX Group for the partnership. Uh, we are now finishing this webinar, so I hope you found the information worthwhile, and we will be joining then. Everybody, please join the link that was sent in the chat that you probably received by email, and we're looking forward to see you all at the breakout sessions that is starting uh, in a couple minutes. So thank you again, everyone, for joining, and I'll see you soon at the breakout session.